Hello, and a very warm welcome to the first episode of this playlist dedicated to describing individual poisons. In this and future episodes, we'll look at a number of well-known and more obscure of these deadly substances. Where do they come from? How do they work? What are the symptoms? And are there any ways of reversing their effects so that the victim may survive? And of course, many other interesting facts. But it's important to remember that not all poisons are given intentionally. And in fact, most cases of poisoning involve accidentally coming into contact with the wrong substance. That's because many plants, animals and naturally occurring substances are toxic, very much depending on the dose and route of exposure. Even something that appears fairly harmless like common salt or sugar can kill when taken in the wrong circumstances. So we begin by looking at probably the most notorious of poisons, the favourite of many crime novels, strychnine. Why did Dr Watson conclude that a man had died from its effects in a popular Sherlock Holmes story? Which animals are immune to strychnine's high toxicity? And how did strychnine help win Olympic gold? To find out, please continue watching this episode of Venena Mundi. <laughs> <laughs> On the 11th of December 2015, a man bought a return ticket from Euston Station in London to Manchester. Here he changed trains to Saddleworth, where he stopped off at the Clarence pub. The landlord had never seen him before and patiently answered the man's questions about how to get to the top of the nearby hill and a characteristic rock formation called Wimbury Stones. Regardless of the landlord's reservations about the late hour and poor weather conditions, the man went out. As he made his way up the slope, he was seen by two groundsmen working for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Then night fell. The following morning, a cyclist passing Dovestone Reservoir saw a body lying on its back, with its arms by the side. The police were called and established that it was that of a man. In his pockets were £130 in cash and three train tickets, but there was nothing else that could be used to name him, like credit cards or a driving licence. The body was removed to a nearby Royal Oldham Hospital, where an autopsy was carried out. There, chemical analysis of the tissues detected strychnine, compelling evidence that he died from consuming this poison. But who was he, and what really happened on Saddleworth Moor that night? Was it murder or suicide? On balance, the evidence pointed to suicide, since the container for the poison with his fingerprints was later found nearby. However, his motive remains completely unknown. Nevertheless, after investigating for more than two years, the police did eventually shed some light on this mystery. The man was identified as 67-year-old David Lytton, who had recently returned from 10 years of living in Pakistan. Previous to that, he'd worked in a Mayfair casino and driven trains for the London Underground. They subsequently managed to find his ex-girlfriend from years earlier, who reported that he'd been a bit of a loner and that he liked to keep his own company. But nothing to say that he was in any way mentally unstable. The inquest heard that his return to England was precipitated by visa problems in Pakistan, but other than that, there was nothing to indicate why he might return back to England just to commit suicide. Why not stay in Pakistan? And why choose this particular location? That's a mystery that David Lytton took with him to the grave. But he evidently had a reason, and did so in the most attention-grabbing fashion, using one of the world's most infamous poisons. So why has strychnine brought about such notoriety? On the face of it, it's no more or less remarkable than many other plant-derived poisons. However, two factors make it stand out like few others. The first is that it has grabbed popular attention by being a poison of choice in many crime novels. Although known as a poison from ancient times, it first notably appeared in print as a homicidal toxin 
in Sir Arthur Conan's Doyle Sherlock Holmes book, The Sign of Four, in 1890. Being a medically qualified physician as well as an author, Conan Doyle would have been very familiar with its effects. In the book, Dr. Watson talks about the use of strychnine medicinally as a stimulant and then describes the body of a dead man with characteristic features identical to someone who has died from strychnine poisoning. More about these symptoms shortly. Strychnine then appears in The Invisible Man, written by H.G. Wells in 1897. Once again as a medicinal draft, and not for its poisonous effects. Having wandered the street and watched some children play, the invisible man tells his companion, After a time I crawled home, took some food and a strong dose of strychnine, and went to sleep in my clothes on my unmade bed. Strychnine is a grand tonic to make the flabbiness out of a man. However, strychnine reaches the pinnacle of its use as a homicidal poison in the writings of the crime-writing queen herself, Agatha Christie. She introduced a strychnine poisoning to propel the plot in her very first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. Published in 1920, it introduces Hercule Poirot on the trail of the murder of Emily Inglethorpe, a rich old woman poisoned with strychnine. Poirot reveals that the murder was committed by Alfred Inglethorpe, her second husband, in order to inherit the fortune and run off with his second cousin, Evelyn Howard. If reading books isn't your thing, you might have come across strychnine thanks to Alfred Hitchcock's film Psycho, in which Norman Bates used it to murder his mother and her lover. And strychnine also makes a cameo appearance in Poisoning Pigeons in the Park, a song by mathematician and singer-songwriter Tom Lehrer. My pulse will be quickening with each drop of strychnine, we feed to a pigeon, it just takes a smidgen to poison a pigeon in the park. The other factor behind strychnine's notoriety are the symptoms of its poisoning. As already mentioned, while small doses were often used as a mild stimulant, an overdose of strychnine usually starts with twitching, but progresses to horrific whole body muscle contractions as the nervous system careers out of control. Since the muscles on the back of the body are stronger than those on the front, victims nearly always arch upwards with their arms clenched at the sides and only the heels and the back of the head resting on the ground. These symptoms closely resemble those of the disease tetanus, which means that strychnine poisoning can easily be mistaken for the former. In both cases, the arching of the back is given the name of tetanic contraction or tetanic spasms. These severe spasms can be triggered by any minor events that stimulate the senses, a loud sound, a physical touch, a draft of air, or light. After each convulsion there is a period of calm before another bout of spasms begins. Most victims survive between two and five of these bouts before the muscles controlling their breathing become paralysed and they suffocate. What makes things worse is during the whole process the victim is horribly and painfully aware of what is going on, as the nerves of the brain are also stimulated to give height and perception. It really is an agonising and terrifying way to die. Fortunately, nowadays strychnine causes very few deaths. That's mainly due to the fact that in Christie's day and before, strychnine was astonishingly easy to get hold of. You could buy it over the counter in any local chemist shop. People like Mrs. Inglethorpe in Christie's novel were prescribed strychnine tonics to increase their appetite and invigorate their nerves. However, cases of accidental overdose and the recognition that strychnine is not as medically beneficial as it was once thought led to it being removed from pharmaceutical practice, both in the UK and abroad. It's no surprise that as it became harder to get, the cases of poisoning both accidental and deliberate fell sharply, but not yet entirely. For about 30 years, there continued to be on average one death per year in the UK, where all but one were suicides. That's because strychnine continued to be available in hardware stores as a rat poison or to kill other small mammal pests like squirrels and rabbits. Therefore, most of the individuals who took strychnine have obtained it in the form of such pesticides. Remarkably, strychnine continued to be used by licensed pest controllers to exterminate moles as recently as 2006, 
However, it was banned that year from this final use because it causes the animals unnecessary suffering and it is now illegal to sell or purchase strychnine in the UK. OK, so what is strychnine and how does it work? In simple terms, strychnine is a poisonous molecule from plants, specifically from plants in the family Loganaceae of genus Strychnos. The genus of plants was named by Carl Linnaeus in 1753 from the ancient Greek word for acrid or bitter to reflect the frequent bitterness of their various parts and consists of about 200 trees and climbing shrubs. These are primarily distributed throughout the warm regions of Asia with about 60 species, the Americas similarly with about 60 species, and Africa with about 75 species. The seeds and bark of many of these plants contain strychnine, but not all. Those most closely associated with strychnine production are Strychnos nux vomica and the St. Ignatius bean, or Strychnos ignatii. Strychnos nux vomica is a tree native to the tropical forests on the Malabar coast of southern India, Sri Lanka and Indonesia. It typically grows to a height of about 12 metres or 40 feet and has a crooked short thick trunk, the wood of which is close grained and very durable. The tree's fruit has an orange colour and is about the size of a large apple with a hard rind and contains five seeds which are covered with soft wool-like fibres. The ripe seeds look like flattened discs, which are very hard. These seeds are the main source of strychnine, which was first imported to and sold in Europe very early on by traders, both as a medicine and poison. According to historical sources, preparations containing what scientists assume to be strychnine were used to kill feral dogs, cats and birds in Europe as early as 1640. It then found its way into medicinal uses and of course as a poison to eliminate people. Strychnos ignatii on the other hand is a woody climbing shrub growing in the Philippines. The fruit of the plant, known as St Ignatius bean, contains as many as 25 seeds embedded in the pulp. Once again the seeds are the main source of the toxic substance. As is the case with most substances from nature, both of these plants' poisonous properties were known for centuries, long before chemists uncovered any active ingredients. Indeed, the ancient Indians were aware of the toxicity of Strychnos nux vomica probably as far back as 3,000 years ago. However, it doesn't appear to have been used as a poison by then to any significant degree, at least in the early days, probably because of the immediately noticeable bitter taste. The chemical substance that is strychnine was eventually first isolated by French chemists Joseph Bienname Caventeau and Pierre Joseph Pelletier in 1818 from the Saint Ignatius Bean. Both men worked in a makeshift laboratory at the back of Caventeau's apothecary shop in Paris. They pioneered a way of extracting various chemical substances from plants using solvents and thereby isolated a number of compounds including chlorophyll, strychnine, brucine and quinine. Quinine sulfate later proved to be an important remedy for the disease malaria, whose routine use continued until even quite recently. Neither of the partners chose to patent any of their discoveries, releasing them for wider use. They found strychnine to be a white, colourless but very bitter solid. Subsequently, chemists classified strychnine as an alkaloid. Indeed, the discovery of nitrogen in alkaloids was again the work of Caventeau and Pelletier. Other examples of alkaloids include caffeine, morphine, nicotine and others too numerous to mention. The extremely complex chemical structure of strychnine was eventually determined in 1946 by the British chemist Sir Robert Robinson working at Manchester and Oxford universities. Then in 1954, this alkaloid was first synthesized chemically from scratch in the laboratory by American chemist Robert B. Woodward, working mainly at Harvard University. This is one of the most complex and famous syntheses in the history of organic chemistry. As a result, both chemists won the Nobel Prize, Robinson in 1947 for his work on alkaloids, and Woodward in 1965 for what has become a classic in chemical synthesis. The structure was determined as being that of a terpene indole alkaloid. 
Terpenes are a class of naturally occurring plant products consisting of compounds with a particular chemical composition, consisting of units of 5 carbon and 8 hydrogen atoms in differing proportions. The indole part refers to the fact that the strychnine molecule contains an indole nucleus as part of its structure. Indole itself is a particular type of organic compound containing nitrogen. The chemical structure of strychnine therefore consists of an indole core linked to a highly complex three-dimensional system of fused carbon rings. Here are the chemical structure and three-dimensional shape of the molecule in their full glory. As you can imagine, making such a molecule in the laboratory is extremely difficult and is a feat of chemical science. No wonder that Woodward received the Nobel Prize for its synthesis, as well as for other chemical molecules. In nature, plants make strychnine by combining the molecules of tryptamine and secologanin, catalyzed by the enzyme strictosidine synthase. Plants then follow this up with six further steps before the final molecule of strychnine is created. Whilst most of the intermediate molecules have been isolated and identified, some of the specific enzymes involved continue to be unknown. Nevertheless, it's a marvel of what plant chemistry and metabolism is capable of. So why should plants bother with such complexity? It's because strychnine is undoubtedly produced to protect them from being eaten by animals. The bitter taste and high toxicity are enough to put them off. Significantly though, a handful of animals are immune to strychnine. Amongst these are species of fruit bats that have evolved resistance to poisonous alkaloids from the toxic fruit they eat. Which brings us neatly as to how the poison works. At its simplest, strychnine excites nerves and muscles, but not in a medically beneficial way as was once thought and why in small doses it was used as the stimulant and tonic. On the level of cell physiology, Strychnine interferes with chemical receptors or motor neurons, in other words, those nerves that control movement. Normally, electrical signals are sent along these nerve fibers from the brain to muscles in order to make them move. Significantly, nerve cells are not directly connected to each other or to muscles, but communicate across gaps called synapses between them using chemical messenger molecules called neurotransmitters. Two such neurotransmitters are important in the case of strychnine. One is the go message telling a nerve cell to fire, causing the muscle cell to contract. The other is the stop message which tells the nerve not to fire. When all is working as it should, the balance of these two chemicals prevents false signals triggering nerve fibers to fire and muscles to contract. Strychnine, however, attaches to glycine receptors and blocks the stop signals. The result is that there is now nothing to prevent the action of the GO neurotransmitter, which means that the slightest stimulus will now cause the nerves to signal and therefore the muscle to contract. Contractions triggered this way lead to spasms throughout the body, and when these affect the muscles of the respiratory system, the person can't breathe anymore and simply suffocates. Before we end this episode, it's worth mentioning the role of strychnine as a performance enhancing drug. We've seen how small doses can stimulate the nervous system and were hence used as a kind of pick-me-up tonic. Well, this does not escape the attention of various people taking part in sport. Indeed, historians attribute the very first recorded instance of drug use in Olympics to strychnine. At the 1904 Olympics held in St. Louis, Missouri, Thomas Hicks allegedly won the marathon with a little help from strychnine, egg whites and brandy, given to him by his trainer. An article in the British Guardian newspaper describes how a cocktail of poison and brandy led to Olympic gold. Hicks was given approximately one milligram of strychnine sulfate and some brandy, which appeared to revive him, but not for long. So he was given a second dose of strychnine. When he crossed the final line, he collapsed and was too weak to collect his medal. Much more of this dubious help from his team and Hicks might have been killed, but he did recover and lived until the age of 76, although he never competed again. Remarkably, despite taking a stimulant on two occasions during the race, Hicks was never stripped of his medal.
Nevertheless, strychnine was quickly banned, as it not only enhanced a sports person's performance, but was outright dangerous. But incredibly, it continues to raise its head from time to time. For example, it was reputedly used for doping in the Tour de France. In 1959, the official tour doctor intercepted a package of strychnine meant for one of the cycling teams. Even more incredibly, Hicks was not the last Olympic athlete to take strychnine. At the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, the Chinese volleyball player Wu Dan was found to have taken the substance. Her excuse was that she'd accidentally taken the substance as part of the Chinese medicine she'd been prescribed by a herbalist treating a medical condition. The lengths and dangers some athletes are prepared to go in order to win is staggering. But that's not all. Strychnine's use as a stimulant has not been limited to human athletes only. The very successful Australian racehorse Far Lap was also allegedly fed strychnine, and if that wasn't enough, cocaine and other doping drugs including caffeine. Finally, although strychnine is a popular poison in crime novels, it is actually not that good at killing people, at least when given orally. That's because even when diluted in a ratio of 1 in 130,000 parts of water, the bitter taste can still be tasted. If it is injected, a minuscule amount is enough, but it's not that easy to jab someone with a syringe. And even then there is some hope, since the effects can be significantly reduced by using antidotes like benzodiazepines, some of which act as extremely powerful anticonvulsants. We will look at a number of cases involving the deliberate homicidal use of strychnine in the playlist about notable poisoners. Amongst these are Dr. William Palmer and Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. I hope you found this episode interesting. As we've seen, strychnine is a highly toxic plant product, the favourite of many crime writers and popularised by those like Agatha Christie and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Although it was formerly widely accessible for questionable therapeutic purposes, incidences of accidental or purposeful poisoning are now thankfully extremely rare, owing to the fact that it's nearly impossible to get hold of. In the next episode of this playlist, we'll turn to cyanide, another of those poisons so popular amongst the writers of popular criminal fiction. Meanwhile, if you like the content, please give it a thumbs up and use the comments below to say what you think or what you'd like to see in the future. In the meantime, please don't forget to subscribe so that I don't get lonely, and please click on the notification bell to make sure that you don't miss the next episode. Thank you for watching, bye for now, and I hope you can join me next time.